is to been a year unlike any other, uh, and 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 it's not over. Uh, we we continue to experience a surge of COVID nineteen cases nationally, and in particular in Arizona, uh, which is on the upslope, and the the impact to the citizens and families of Arizona, um, the healthcare system and healthcare workers is significant and not to be underestimated. Uh, but there is hope uh, and there are frameworks of support and dare I say, um, uh, kindness, charity and blessings that are afforded to us. And uh, we're so appreciative, I'm so thankful that I can introduce um, a longtime friend and colleague of mine, Dr. Teresa Cullen. Um, as you see on the slide here, Terry is the public health director for Pima County. She joined in the middle of the pandemic. Uh, but Terry has a distinguished career uh, over a, a few years um, in national leadership roles for the Indian Health Service, Veterans Health Administration, work internationally and nationally with the Regan Street Institute and Indiana University, um, and, and has really been a pioneer and leader in so many areas, um, um, but, but was a co-author of a really important uh, article published this past summer in Health Affairs on a framework of healing for healthcare, healthcare workers. Uh, for me, one of the things that helps me sleep at night, there are plenty of things that keep me awake, but one of the things that helps me sleep at night is to know that people like Terry are working with and for us, are in our state, uh, and bring a tremendous mix of expertise, experience, but compassion. Um, and so um, I will now turn the, the stage over to Dr. Terry Cullen. We'll switch up to Terry's slides. And Terry, welcome and thanks for joining us today. Um, thank you so much. Uh, I, I do want people to know that two of my favorite people in the world, Dr. Carol, Dr. Brooklyn are on this panel with me. So it feels more like a chance to have a dialogue and to share with you the lessons I have learned, the experiences I have had, and then hopefully combined as we walk through the discussion, be able to help guide all of us to a better, more saner way to approach what is happening. Mark is right. I come to the Pima County Health Department from a, a pretty long um, storied, I would say more storied than anything else career with uh, the federal government and then an academic position. I, I'm gonna talk briefly to you today before we go in the dialogue about healthcare worker resiliency in the face of a pandemic. The reason why this is such a critical topic is because obviously we're in the pandemic, but when we started thinking about wanting to write something, it was in February. It was before there was anything like we were seeing today. And I'm going to share with you the reasons for why I elected to publish an article in Health Affairs. And so the next slide will give you and share with you some of the information that we've seen about pandemic control. I want to start with this because I think what's important to note is that, um, and I, I do public health now, so we understand increasingly the need for multi-pronged approaches for COVID-19, for what we call layered mitigation, for us to get these 10 little building blocks. For those of you who are familiar with the CDC publication recently, these are stolen from their 10 building blocks. The reason why I wanna share this with you is I think that this is a model that is really important as we talk about healthcare resiliency. And on the next slide, what we're gonna talk about briefly is what will it mean to have a multi-pronged approach Approach. That multi-pronged approach means that we need to look at what is needed to identify, prevent, mitigate, and manage post-traumatic stress disorder. My concern right now, and it's increasing, is the long-term impact of what we are going to see on our healthcare workers. Now, this is not to minimize the impact that we know will also happen on other frontline workers. It's just today we're focusing primarily on healthcare workers. And what we know is that to make change, to really be able to make a difference, to create that safe space that Mark talked about, which is where we all wanna go, will require both policy and operational changes. 
So the next slide just talks with you really briefly about what are the risk factors for PTSD. Most of these are probably familiar with you, uh, to you if you've paid any attention to what's going on in the delivery of healthcare right now, whether it be delivery of healthcare in the outpatient setting, in the inpatient setting, in the hospice setting, in any kind of long-term or assisted living setting. These are risk factors that are confronting all of us. When you look at, um, as you know, we're starting immunization this week in Arizona. When you look at groups that are 1A, healthcare workers, EMS, long-term care, assisted living, what you see is the potential for all of these risk factors to be parts of the lives and the experience of those individuals that are providing care within those settings. Knowing someone who has had COVID uh, yesterday, or I think it's today, 1,800 cases in Pima County. It's hard to soon imagine anyone who doesn't know someone who knew someone that had COVID. So we know these risk factors are increasing. Next slide. So what I really want to talk to you briefly about is really what are some strategies to help create and support resiliency. For those of you familiar with prevention, you know there's primary, secondary, and tertiary prevention. It's a model that we used when we wrote this article for Health Affairs, but really it's a model because it works in terms of trying to figure out what do you need primary? How do we prevent PTSD for happening? And you can see this, and these slides will be available, so I'm not gonna go through that. But what's important to note is that having a logic model, having a framework that allows us to identify, evaluate, and implement different strategies is critical to us being able to address what I believe is going to be this onslaught of post-traumatic stress disorder. Next slide. The next slide then talks briefly about secondary and tertiary treatment and managing long-term. Obviously our goal is to prevent long-term sequelae from post-traumatic stress disorder. Our real goal is to prevent post-traumatic stress disorder from happening in our providers. However, I think it's important to note that if you go back and you think just briefly about the factors that we know contribute to PTSD, most of them are present. So unless we do something, unless we have an appropriate intervention, it's difficult to imagine that we won't have this other crisis. The head of this article, uh, when we published it, is really beyond PPE. We know that we protect our providers through PPE. You will recall early on that that in and of itself was a difficult situation. But we are beyond that now, and we have a moral, personal, emotional, spiritual responsibility to make sure that we provide our healthcare workers and other frontline workers with what is needed to help mitigate what, we, what I believe is going to be the next pandemic which is post-traumatic stress disorder. Next slide. And what I really want to share with you is a, a little, is a personal story about why in February I was so worried. Um, just like Vince, I was active duty public health service. Both of us had multiple deployments in multiple different places. Um, I had done a lot of international work, but in 2014, I responded to the Ebola pandemic. And I responded as a volunteer with Partners in Health, who, as you may or may not know, is an international NGO. And they focus on what they call an accompaniment model. You accompany individuals, communities, families. You engage and share in what is happening to them. So I was initially in Liberia, then I went to Sierra Leone. I had the, the opportunity to help set up and run the only maternity Ebola um, unit in Sierra Leone prior to Doctors Without Borders setting up one later. And I wanna talk with you briefly about that experience for me because that experience helped inform why I felt attention to PTSD was so critical. In that experience, and you can see a few words here, but what happens in a situation where death becomes overwhelming, where abnormal becomes normal, where sleep is something you dream about because you know you're not gonna get it, 
when every possibility for light seems to dim, regardless of the wonderful and the most amazing people you are working with, you find yourself in a tunnel. And for me, at least, what happened during my months working with Ebola led to a, a post-traumatic stress disorder situation for myself. I want to talk briefly about this because I want to share with you that all of this can be modified and that today, while I can still go to where the light is dim very quickly because of that time period and that experience in my life, I have been able to develop other support and resilient opportunities that allow me to now say, and I say this with all intention, that I am so grateful that I had the opportunity to provide care during the Ebola epidemic in Sierra Leone. However, there was a cost to that. And that I think is what we are seeing with our healthcare workers today. The one thing I really wanna focus on is when abnormal becomes normal because you are seeing that now with any of the pictures that you are seeing, any of the information that is being broadcast. When you walk through an ICU, and obviously in Sierra Leone we didn't have ICUs, but when you walk through an ICU and every bed is full and there are huge numbers of ventilated patients and there are IV drips all outside the rooms because people can't get through them, it becomes normal. And this concept of normalization is one thing that contributes to the anguish, the pain, the pathos, the incredible sadness that accompanies people that are working in these situations. And I'm just going to share one experience with that. When um, I, was I, I was so blessed, I worked with these amazing community members from Sierra Leone. Um, remember Ebola, we had chlorine, we had our sprayers and our chlorine people and our bleach people. And um, we had, because I was doing OB, um, wonderful, wonderful midwives. And I had a midwife that was working with me, a student. And I remember one day we went outside the unit and we sat under this big tree and I said to her, I need you to know that this is not normal. I need you to remember that what we just saw in this unit with people dying of lots of different ways, where people watching their dead baby be in an incubator and eating their lunch with people not knowing how they can touch another person, it's not normal. And while that normalization process is a part of what happens to us, it's one of the contributors to PTSD and, and the moral anguish that occurs to people as they go forward. So I just want to share that with you. Um, I have lots of stories as Mark and Vince know. Um, but I think what's important to note is that when the abnormal becomes normal, you then have the opportunity for, the, for normalization to occur throughout the next years of your life. And that's what's really important here. I wanted to share one other comment with you um, that happened. And I worked with uh, amazing people during Ebola. And the one comment that has stuck with me for the last five to six years is the one where, you, you know with Ebola, the death rate is very, very high, um, unlike COVID where the death rate is, um, is decreasing, thank goodness, because we're doing more and more uh, interventions that seem to be working. But the commitment we made to people is that people didn't have to die wet, they didn't have to die in darkness, and they didn't have to die alone. And that's what we were able to do. So in some ways, I think what happens when you're in a traumatic situation, you figure out what are the things you can do? What are the things you can touch? And you work together to make a difference with those. So we can go to that next slide. And I'm almost done my slides. I just want to remind people of these things. I, I feel like in some ways I, I mimic Mark, who always talks about the kindness. Um, but kindness is critical. I will tell you there are times I forget. There are times I don't connect. I don't relate. I have little compassion. Um, 
and I'm not strong and I'm not brave and I'm not kind. So I'm not any of these things that are on this slide. But yet in my heart and in my being, I know this is what we need to do. You know, I'm um, a public health director. I came into this job. I've never been a public health director before. Um, I came in uh, kind of near the beginning and now we're a lot of months through it. And uh, as Mark knows, because there's days I send to Mark, uh, I don't know where the joy is. And I, and I know there's joy. I, I truly believe I know their story, but there's days this can be really overwhelming for all of us. And so I think one of the goals of Mark wanting to present this was to really help uh, help us have a dialogue to try to figure out what is that path? What, what do we need to embrace? What do we need to uh, implement? What do we need to operationalize? What do we need from a policy perspective to move forward? So the next slide. Um, I just wanted to share with you on this next slide what, what we're doing at Pima County Public Health Department. Um, we want to ensure that people know we value them. I, I, I will tell you there are days that I think our staff doesn't know that we value them, that we forget it, that we are uh, peddling as fast as we can, especially now with the vaccine being available. Um, it's exhausting, it's overwhelming, and we make mistakes. Um, we make mistakes in terms of communication, in terms of engagement, in terms of letting people know what is happening. And those are critical parts for us from a public health perspective as well, as well as from a clinical perspective. And what we are trying to do is do the best we can do. Uh, I actually asked <laughs> some, a hospital group last night to just to just indulge me with a little patience. And I know it's hard, it's hard to be patient right now. Um, and, uh, but, but it's so critical that we try to figure that out. Okay, the next slide is just the last thing that we do is how can we support staff during this time of crisis? And that's a question we ask ourselves regularly and perhaps we'll talk about some of that today. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up. Thank you for the opportunity to share and to hopefully help inform the rest of this conversation. Terry, thank you so much. Uh, I so appreciate that, that blend of, of heart and, and head, you know, that the, the, the framework of change that's evidence-based married to the, the grounding in what it means to be compassionate during a pandemic, what it means to be kind, um, kind to not just others, but kind to oneself, and uh, and what it means to be to be patient. Um, could could you chat just a little bit more about about that concept of patience right now? Vaccine delivered to the state yesterday, some vaccine limited quantities in Maricopa and your county in Pima County. Uh, you know, the public and all of us will be impatient to receive, but, but that, 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 that word patience is a loaded word, is it not? And it's, um, uh, I'm reminded that the word patience with a C-E on the end is the same as clinical patient, and, and it comes from pati in the Latin. The English derivation comes from Latin, and it means to suffer. It's hard to be patient. It's hard to ask for patience. What have you learned about when you ask for patients like with that group last night? Oh, it, it's such a great question. And we have actually just had the discussion again this morning at the health department, because you know what? We, we are missing the mark in some things. We're not communicating well. We're not ensuring that we're unable to ensure that everyone can get what they need when they want it at a time that's appropriate for them. And so a lot of the discussion about patience is, is interestingly enough, Mark, centered with forgiveness too. That patience itself, our asking for patience from you is simultaneously us asking for forgiveness because we can't be all things to all people right now. And some of that I think is also coupled with the need for reassurance, right? Like we're asking people to be patient because occasionally things that are beyond our control, but also because we believe that it is okay 
that it is okay to wait four days. It is okay to wait five days. And yet at the same time, what we don't wanna do is minimize that incredible anguish and concern and accelerated worry that people are having. If we go back to post-trauma, all those things contribute, right? If you knew that now something's available that could help you or help your loved one or help someone else that's in a crisis situation, of course you want it. I think that that happens to all of us in terms of we go to an emergency room and let, let's speak non-pandemic. We go to an ER and really, I don't want to wait an hour. I just want to get seen right now. What's the problem? Come on. So I, I think uh, perhaps one of the lessons that the pandemic is teaching us from a societal perspective is, um, is this need for patients, I mean, when we look at the vaccine, it's obviously really what we're seeing. But, but I don't think it's an easy, easy lesson, and I don't think it's black and white. I think impatience has a real role here. Impatience with a system that seems to have not been responsive enough to help prevent people dying. Yeah, it's so interesting to think of that balance where impatience matters in emergencies, in patient matters, in a public health response, it can, it can make a difference, an important difference. Um, Vince, um, reflections from you on this concept of finding patients, both in your current experience today, as well as your past experience. I neglected to note at the beginning of, of our rounds today that both Terry and Vince are retired admirals uh, and Terry's obviously spoken of her deployments. Vince, you've had a number of deployments. Um, uh, what are your thoughts about some of what Terry has mentioned? Oh, well, good afternoon, everyone. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here, Mark, and hello, Terry. Um, one of the thing, things that strikes me in this whole episode, um, and it, it, it is an uh, episode with breaks in it, and the most recent break being the, uh, the vaccine and the distribution thereof, um, is that as healthcare workers, we are not accustomed to being overwhelmed. We are not accustomed to being dependent on or everyone else in the team. I have seen among some colleagues a level of guilt because they're not in an ICU. They're not helping by doing whatever. The best that they may do is a mask, and hand washing and social distancing and um, the other things that we know prevent disease. Um, I think that the, the acts of kindness that we can do for one another is to be supportive and to say that these are challenges that we have met before and this acute situation will become less acute as time goes on. And again, I, um, I, I practiced nephrology for uh, so many years and, and everyone knows that uh, acute renal failure after so long becomes chronic. Um, and you do what you can for support of the patient as well as support of self. Uh, until it becomes chronic, and then you know what to do for uh, the patient. I think one of the things that particularly those people who are in ICU care is that team approach to taking care of these patients. I believe that the publicity that went on in the early part of uh, this crisis um, was something that was uh, difficult for the, the intensive care teams to have because they're accustomed to fixing everything 
that comes down the pike. The lay people are not supposed to see how the sausage is made. That it took a while to determine that proning a patient is going to help. Try error. Well, that's seeing how the sausage is made sometimes. So they had to depend on one another, and which is a good thing for everyone to learn that we are dependent. Um, we often don't think about the, the fact that, you know, that, um, that maintenance person, when they come, they're doing something that is really important. Uh, or the uh, person from housekeeping, you know, if, if all this stuff piled up, I couldn't do my job. Um, but seeing the interdependency of that as a team I think it's helped our colleagues, no matter what they're doing, whether they're doing nursing or respiratory therapy, or they're the physician or nurse practitioner, they've helped uh, to, to tighten that team. And, and let me just say something on a positive note, because I feel like I'm hanging crepe here, um, is that this vaccine has inserted a level of buoyancy for everyone. Uh, just the fact of its distribution has created some bounciness, that buoyancy that says, yep, it's going to get better. As a matter of fact, one of the ways that you can see that the buoyancy is happening is that we're arguing a bit of, well, how come we're doing it? This, I really think the prisoners should not get it first. And we're doing something else with this. We've got time to argue. That means that as human beings, we are all human. Um, I, some of you will remember the, the, uh, these numbers, 68, 95, and 99.7. Think about it in a moment. That's the memnonic that goes for remembering the distribution of standard deviations in the Gaussian distribution, the normal curve. I bring that up because when you learn normal curve, it's going to be 68% of the people who are going to not do what they ought to do. And when we look around at people who are denying, people who won't take the vaccine for whatever reason, it's normal human behavior, and it is our responsibility to bring them on. Um, I, I'm sure I've talked too much because we do want to hear, I think, some things from uh, the, the audience. I mean, I can go with... Uh, about 15 or 20 miles an hour with gusts up to 50 <laughs> or 60. So let me stop. Well, Vince, I think we all feel that way. And sometimes some of our gusts are like 80 miles an hour just because you need to, you need to sprint sometimes. It's challenging. There, there was a question for us. And thank you, Vince, for those, those comments. I, I'd, like to, I'd like to come back to one or two of them. But first, um, someone asked a question. Can, can you comment? So, Terry, I'll, I'll ask you for your thoughts first. Can you comment on the general feeling of healthcare workers w feeling overworked and unsupported? And I suspect um, this is big picture, big, big definition of healthcare workers, uh, anyone who's connected in any way to the care of someone, uh, I consider a healthcare worker. But probably there, is, there are differences between how some organizations are approaching this and how some people feel in those organizations. Um, any, any thoughts, Terry, on that? And any thoughts on how the framework also that you co-published could be helpful for leaders in different organizations? So, uh, so first off, I think this is really critical. And the first thing we need to do in, is acknowledge this is that it is ubiquitous, the number of healthcare workers, and it can be big healthcare workers, small healthcare worker, um, Mark, whatever, capitalized or not capitalized, people that are feeling unsupported and overworked. Many, many people 
have worked every day. If you go back to what we know are risk factors for PTSD, it's a failure to get a break. It's a failure to get rest. It's a failure to have any sense of normalcy be a part of your life. And when you are working shift work, um, emergency room, ICU, hospital-based care, what you're seeing is that what will appear to most healthcare workers as endless. And I do want to mention something that Vin said, because if you look at the curves we've at least seen in Arizona, right? We, we were floating around, we had a bad summer, Arizona, um, the U, uh, University of Arizona, we had a little bitty spike here down in Tucson, and now we're off the curve, right? So people that have been doing this for nine months may have had a little respite, but now there's been no respite and there's no respite in sight that I can see. Um, I mean, we're all hopeful for the vaccine. So this concept of being under uh, supported and overworked is critical and it is reflective of what is being asked for the individuals that are participating. Vince talked briefly about teams. What we know is that there are some things that are critical to be done to help alleviate that those feelings. And we know some of this because of um, critical de-stressing in the past for people that have responded to emergent situations, 9-11, uh, hurricanes, things like that. What we know is that debriefing is really important, that even if you are feeling overworked, um, under-supported, there are ways that an organization, uh, there are things an organization can do to in, to help minimize that. But I think the very first thing we need to recognize is we are asking people to do too much. And we have asked them to do too much for the last nine months. Now, that doesn't mean that people won't do it, right? We, we don't see people not showing up. We see people running towards towards what's happening there. We see people that really care about it. But from an operational perspective, the country itself, to go back to what needs to happen, there needs to be an understanding of the cost, both emotionally and physically, of what we are asking people to do. When we look at the CARES Act, when we look at funding cycles, we see no appropriation for mental health. We see no even acknowledgement of the need for what is potentially helpful. What we see is salaries go up. That, that's appropriate right now in Arizona to try to get ICU nurses more power there. But long term, that doesn't obliterate or mitigate that feeling of not being supported. Yeah, I've heard just some amazing stories of from some colleagues in the state, um, without naming organizations, who who thought that support for their staff um, would be one thing, and so they kind of built the one thing, and they uh, and it turned out to not be anything like a t-shirt. T-shirts are nice especially if they're nice t-shirts right, that we can sleep in and, and they're soft. Uh, uh, but it, it turned out to be some of those simple um, but important engagements of saying hi to people in parking lots as they were coming to their ships uh, and just having human interactions because people were coming from parking lots with masks and in you know, in hospital settings are going into PPE levels and layers and, and contact. Something you said earlier, Terry, touch, um, the holding of hands, the enabling of family members to be there at a bedside holding hands is so different now. And, and, I, and I know that struggle is so hard. I'm curious about both of your, 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 your thoughts about that in ways that, as well as the folks participating in today, if they could if they could share with us examples of how you've learned to, to overcome that. I think that's the greatest, the greatest, one of the greatest misses that people have, but the, the supports that are meaningful are sometimes very small, are they not? Yeah, I, I, I wanna talk about this human part of it. 
because I think that that's what we're talking about. When um, my, you know, I'm trained in family medicine and I worked on the reservation a long time. And my husband used to always say, I never wanted anything. And he said, and I finally figured out why you don't want things. He said, because the tools of your trade are touch, hearing, and speaking. Now, one would hope I had a stethoscope too, but, but it's true from a family medicine model, it, that relationship, that understanding of connection, that humanness requires the senses, right? So what have we done? We've put, we've had to put barriers between many, many of the senses. And so Mark, I think, I think you are onto something here that if there are ways we can mitigate those barriers, ways we can say, despite A, we can, we can still see you, mm. we can touch you, even if it's through things, that that, that is helpful. And not just for the patient um, healthcare provider relationship, but the healthcare provider to family, to each other, to other healthcare workers. Yeah, well said. Vince, any thoughts from your perspective on that? Unmuting, I, I think certainly the, the touch is, is very real. And um, even with the glove and even with the mask, I, I've been so impressed that uh, already the entrepreneurs have uh, put plastic on the, uh, the tie on, so at least you can see part of the expression of face. And um, just that ability to connect, how important it is, even though things may be chaotic around, that you will hear uh, a nurse or a doc or even a, a respiratory therapist, whomever, say, I'm sitting here with this patient until they pass. They're holding their hand. It is important as a human to be with another human as their life ends. I mean, and again, uh, this is just a, a matter of humanity. Um, and that's what we bring, I think, to, uh, to every situation, even when we're overwhelmed. And this is an overwhelming situation. Um, I'll, I'll just speak to the doctors. I mean, I think that as a physician, the last time you were truly overwhelmed uh, was probably finishing PGY, or I'm graduating from medical school, starting PGY one when uh, you walked into the hospital and they said you were a doctor. You said, "No, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a medical. I'm fourth year medical." But no, you're really a doctor, and you don't really know. Um, and and we've all had that experience. And um, so that feeling of being overwhelmed, try to bring that back. Uh, to, to understand what those who are caring for COVID is about, as well as to understand yourself in terms of what is it that you can do? Uh, what do other people expect from you as a caregiver? Um, I'm, I'm believing that we have um, uh, others other than physicians on this call. There may be some, so I'm speaking broadly. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Mary Jo Gregory shared an expression with me, uh, uh, scrubs in a broom, that, you know, sometimes what can leaders do in an organization if resources are tight, there, there aren't a lot of additional staff that can be found to help. Um, what can leaders do? And, and Mary Jo, who's not able to uh, participate today, but share with me, it's scrubs in a broom. Can you, can you in real life or even metaphorically just show jacket off scrubs on mask on i can i can sweep what can i do to help um uh i've heard that that's meaningful terry is that something that's part of the framework that that you think is important that you all have published on yeah i i, I think it's that concept of walking a mile in your shoes right mm -hmm. but it's not only walking the mile it's making sure that I'll go back to that's accompaniment model, that I'm accompanying you, that I share with and in 
your experience. And as a result of that, I am able to, I mean, I personally believe you're able to be a better advocate that sometimes we, um, to go back to that question of overworked, under supported, who is the advocate? Who is the voice? Who can make sure that those feelings are heard and that the hearing of those feelings then translates into an action or a, or a change or a, a feeling that enables them to be addressed. You know, I, I go back to that model um, in my slides, that very first model about this co concept of layered mitigation, all these different things we need to do, 10 different things. So some of walking with someone, being there with them is saying, I, I, maybe you need A, like your children, right? Maybe the first child needs this, the second child needs this. Everybody needs something a little different, but I need to know what that need is and I need to be able to address it. So I, I think it's, it's really that, that being there, that being present, that acknowledgement, but, but it's more than that. It's one thing to say, go back to your patients, okay, I get, I get we all need to be patient, but you know what, at some point, I need you to do something. I need there to be leadership. I need there to be a, a policy change. I need there to be a recognition that this will require an organizational and or legislative change to get people's needs met. Yeah, thank you for saying that. One of the really important take homes for me from the Health Affairs article that you and colleagues published was that it laid out that the framework of prevention, treatment, um, and managing long-term effects, but it talked about sustainability, the importance of resources, policy supports, um, money, funding supports. We have opportunities in front of us, all of us today, to help each other. Um, and for me, healthcare workers, Terry, so many of your staff who are doing those contact tracing phone calls. Um, they, they are, they are so important and just as important as people that are wearing scrubs in clinical scenarios and just as exposed to traumatic conversations in families that have lost loved ones uh, in situations that are, that are very difficult. But, but I, I personally feel, and I'm curious about both of your perspective on this, that there's opportunity as well here for us to learn from good things going on today, to look at frameworks such as what you've published and to understand and to start think to, thinking together how we can, we can build a better tomorrow and that tomorrow is next year, 2021, and start to build a more supportive culture in general for our healthcare workforce um, that, that will need resources and, and will need patients um, and we'll need ongoing understanding. I think that's our future. Our number one resource is our people and any organization. And our number one resource right now in our state are some people on this session today and all of our colleagues. What are your thoughts uh, about how we can build some sense of energy towards that when it's, you know, it's a challenging time right now? Yeah. Is your, you're on mute, Vince. Uh, uh, Terry, did you want to go first? No, you go first. Oh, and then I'll okay. I think uh, the only silver lining is what you just said, Mark. When the society begins to understand, uh, even those who don't believe, uh, they can certainly understand that everybody has to be involved in something. Even those people who are anti-vaccine, knows that they know that something must be done. And the only way some things can get done is that society has to come together and have the corporate will to move forward. Um, and, and again, we're talking about 75% of the population of the, of the United States um, to get to the point that we won't have to worry about. And that's a minimum number. And we're not talking about the rest of the world. Um, this brings home very clearly that there uh, are no borders when it comes to disease. And I mean, it, it took a worldwide pandemic for 
for everyone to begin to understand that. So that th those are the kinds of things that can come uh, out of that. It will be unfortunate when, um, when countries that the, the, the leadership has uh, either denied or uh, played games with the, the pandemic uh, will have you know, worse outcomes than, um, than other places uh, when that happens, but everybody will get on board. Terry, so, what's, our, what's our future look like? Well, well the one thing I, I would believe, and to go to what Vin said, you know, never the proverb, never let a disaster not pre create opportunities. So I am actually optimistic these days. I, I'm still overwhelmed and I search for joy sometimes. But you know, I think we are learning so much. I think transparency, creating learning collaboratives is what is really critical here. That all of us regardless of where we are in the pandemic in terms of being a provider or not a provider or touching where I talk about the octopus, the arms of where we're touching the Medusa's um, hair here, but all of us are learning things. And if we can figure out how to collate, share, accelerate, and in the long run, understand that we need to respond as a collective, as a human collective, regardless of where we are on that scaffold, we will move forward and we can move forward in an accelerated fashion. And the lessons that we learned here, if we do it in the right way, can help us for the next one or, the, or not even the next pandemic, but the next adverse situation because we will have strengthened collaborate, we will have established co collaboration, we will have strengthened them. So I, I wanna go back to what happened to me last night where people were impatient. At the same time, what was amazing is they were all on the call. They were all working together. So they may have been impatient, but we had this, we've established these relationships that at least from a public health department, we didn't have previously. So it's really positive. I think that's a, a, a very important insight. And thanks for sharing that. I, I will share with folks and both Terry and Vince, you, you've been helping with this endeavor I'll describe, but there is a well-being collaborative uh, that, is, that is under development right now in Arizona that in partnership with the NARB Institute, um, Banner and other health organizations, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Arizona and Health Choice, and a number of, of engaging um, agencies and organizations and professional societies such as um, the Arizona Nurses Association, Arizona Medical Association. We are, we're working to understand and to build uh, a, a web portal where people can upload digital stories that you can record from your phone or another setting or your still computer, but stories of success, gratitude, and hope. Uh, that can be very brief or longer. There'll be a curated website um, that's not quite ready for me to give you the domain name, but will be ready um, by the new year. And, and we hope that that's part of this, this both systematic change as well as a support for all the valuable folks um, who, are, who are part of the activity. You have three physicians with you here today, but this is not just about physicians. We all know that this is about anyone who's involved in caring for someone else. So um, I share that sense of, of, of glimmer of joy, you know, the bolts of sunshine through the storm clouds um, that feel like our days. Uh, because when I hear those stories just shared with me on the phone with colleagues and, or, or across Zoom, uh, it just it, it it reaffirms for me that the strength of of people to get past differences, to name challenges, including impatience, um, uh, and to almost get past forgiveness to forgive so we can get to other places. We're going to need all those skills for all of you who are listening now or watching on a recording. We're going to need all of your skills. All small acts matter so that we can build better systems and support each other moving forward. Terry, last thoughts from you before we close today? Um, I'm full of gratitude 
for having been able to spend an hour with two of my favorite people, but also to, for all of us to have been given the opportunity to reflect, to take time, find some patience, sit for an hour and think about and talk about what we need to do to move forward. So thanks. Well, thank you so much. You embody, um, be brave, be strong, be kind. Uh, and not all of us can do that 24 seven, but uh, I'll remember that and that, that'll help me moving forward. Uh, Dr. Teresa Cullen, Public Health Director of Pima County. Thank you so much on behalf of all the listeners and, and the NARB Institute and Health Choice Arizona. Everyone take care, be kind to yourselves, um, people you meet and greet, and especially those you disagree with. Um, the more we can find those connections, I think the, the better our well-being is as individuals and as a society. We'll see you at the next Community Grand Rounds in January. Please stay in touch and stay well. Bye now.